The Honorable United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit is now in session. All persons having any business before this Honorable Court may draw near, give their attendance, and they shall be heard. God save the United States of America and this Honorable Court. Good morning. Please be seated. As the litigants know, uh, both Judges Thompson and Stahl, who will not be asking questions this morning, will nevertheless participate in the deliberations uh, and decision in this case as they have up to this point. Uh, Chief Judge Howard, um, the case today is number 161492, Mark W. Eves versus Paul R. LePage. May it please the court, and good morning. My name is David Webert. I'm here with my co-counsel, Carol Garvin. And with the permission of the court, I'd like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal. Yes. I'd like to begin by emphasizing three sets of major concessions that I think really simplify and narrow the case for the Osmond Court. First of all, I want to emphasize our concessions about what we're not challenging and not claiming as an adverse action. We're not claiming or challenging, for example, the governor vetoed bills. Uh, many of the allegations in the complaint are in there solely as evidence of motive, but have nothing to do with the adverse actions that we're alleging. So in no way we're asking for relief from the court from the governor deciding to veto. He can veto all at once, and the Speaker of the House was very fine with the remedies and rights he had as the Speaker of the House to deal with that issue. In fact, the legislature uh, overrode those vetoes by a two-thirds majority. So we're not here bothering this court with matters that can be handled very easily between the executive and legislative branches. I'm not here to challenge any criticisms or comments by the governor that the marketplace of arena of free speech and the Speaker of the House is fully committed to a robust speech on both sides, and he'll take his licks, and he'll take his ability to counter those in the court of public opinion. So when the governor wrote a detailed letter on June 8th making harsh criticisms of the Speaker of the House, we have no complaint about that as an adverse action. When the governor said that Marquis uh, beat his wife or that he was corrupt as, as sin, we're not here about that at all. We, we will deal with that in the public marketplace of ideas. Those are not before me. Even the termination is not an adverse action that we're challenging. The governor did not terminate Mark Eves. So that's not one of the term adverse actions. There are only two adverse actions. And they're both things the governor did, not a third party. He pulled back, he rescinded, he put a stop order, he canceled $132,000. And the second thing he did was he very clearly, and very clearly in the complaint, I think he even admits to it, threatened to withhold the rest of the over $1 million for a 100-year-old charitable, nonprofit, nonpartisan charity committed to helping at-risk children and youths uh, have a, have become good citizens. Those are the only two adverse actions. My second set of concessions relates to state of mind. I admit, and if I lose because of this, so be it, that there are possible legitimate motives for the governor withholding funding. Um, for example, uh, he alleges uh, corruption, financial corruption, uh, lack of qualification, uh, 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 perhaps being a white leader itself probably should be disqualifying in some, if concerned at least. So there are legitimate reasons, but the case law of this court and the U.S. Supreme Court is very clear. That would destroy every race retaliation claim and every First Amendment retaliation claim if the mere possibility of a objectively plausible and legitimate non-discriminatory motive would win the day, and certainly not on a motion to dismiss. This court has held the contrary. Judge Bodine worded it very eloquently and concisely. Um, this court has reiterated that several times, that on a motion to dismiss, and we're only on a motion to dismiss, I'm not asking to win anything today, um, that the motive is the one alleged by the plaintiff, as long as it meets, it's not a too thin of a case, too thin of a case, and those should get thrown out, and this court has said that. And that's uh, my third set of concessions is that we're not alleging that that we're 100% clear that the jury's going to rule in our favor. The jury has to decide that, and there's all kinds of procedures to go down the road. This is a motion to dismiss, so I'm not claiming that you should decide that the, that the improper motive of political affiliation retaliation was the motive, or even the most likely motive. All you have to decide today is that it's a plausible motive, which is much less than likely. It's just plausible. And I, I, your circuit, I went and looked at Shepherds. So you have the honor of having the most circuit court opinions applying Bronte. 
you're number one. You have a close, somebody's a close second, I think the Seventh Circuit, but you're number one. And, and your opinion, when you look at them, many of them aren't circumstantial evidence, is enough, at, especially at this stage of the case, when you have a hypercharged political environment and you have one political opponent taking an adverse action against the other, and then the facts get sorted out later. In this case, we have direct evidence of a very hypercharged, I think in the history of Maine, I'm not aware of a governor making the kind of statements that would veto every bill by a Democrat. Once again, I'm not complaining about that as an adverse action, but it's evidence of political affiliation, discrimination, motive. It's only in the case as motive. So the governor can say those things all he wants, but it's relevant to his motive when he took the 132,000 back and when he threatened to withhold the rest, which are the only two adverse actions I'm showing. Can I you said that the 132,000 was going to be taken from GWH. And I just want to understand exactly how this works. As I understand it, the governor's authority to spend money that is allocated to DOE for miscellaneous educational services gives him the authority to spend money on the Center for Excellence. But the way I understand it, and you tell me if I'm wrong, GWH then chose to implement the provision that says there would be a Center for Excellence by creating a charter school means. Is that right? The statute actually identifies Goodwill Maine as yeah. the only entity that's going to be the Center for Excellence. It actually calls it out and says you're going to be the one. So the statute actually comes Well, what I'm trying to understand is, is there two things. GWH does things apart from the Center for Excellence, correct? A whole lot of things. So yes, okay. So that's point one. Point two. Does the Center for Excellence do anything apart from means? I don't think so. I'm not aware of it. Okay, so the, what I, the, what my question then is, when he pulls back that $132,000 from GWH, he's, under the statute, what he's pulling back is money that he's authorized to spend on the Center for Excellence, which is means. No, because... So why is that wrong? It's actually Goodwill Hinckley in the statute. It actually is the entity that receives the funds. And it's not required to... But you just said GWH is distinct from the Center for Excellence because it does things that are not the Center for Excellence. In other words... But the money goes to the... Well, I know it goes to GWH, but it's appropriate or authorized to be spent only for the Center for Excellence. I don't believe that's correct. The, the, the complaint of is the contrary, and so does the independent... Does the, statute, does the statute give him any authority to spend money on GWH apart from spending it for the Center for Excellence? It's just discretionary funding yeah. is he can give it goodwill hopefully or not. It doesn't say that it has to go to means. No, I didn't say it has to go to means. I thought it was... Well, the statute references the Center for Excellence. It does not authorize spending for GWH apart from the Center for Excellence. Is that right? It actually identifies goodwill hopefully as the recipient of the funds. Right. And so far, insofar as it's implementing the Center for Excellence, isn't that right? It doesn't say that in the budget that appropriated the extra dollars that we're talking I'm about. I'm saying the statute that authorizes him to spend the money in the budget. That's what I'm asking about. Well, there's two sets of money. Mm -hmm. And the original funding has a sort of a, a formula that also goes to other schools. This is on top of that. And this is in a different provision. It didn't have to be there. It, didn't, it wasn't necessary. It was sort of like they kept adding because they thought that the school needed more time to stay on its own two feet. It's, it's, chapter, two, it's chapter 227. So I think that's the discretionary funding we're talking about here. Correct. That's the, that, that's that's the, the original. That's the core money that keeps coming every year. The governor had no discretion over that. It was the extra money. And I understand that was for goodwill painfully in the budget. Let me ask a different way. If Chapter 227 did not exist, would the governor, governor be able to spend this money by giving it to good Yeah, I think the legislature would be authorized to say you can spend money on this school, yes. In, in the budget, regardless of the fact that it also, I mean, there's a connection. I don't think they're, they're, they're dependent on each other, no. It's a separate set of money. Put, put, do you know which one's a museum, right? One's, yes. Bunch of Could the governor spend the state funds that were appropriated to DOE on the museum? Yes, in the sense of he could give the money to Goodwill Hinckley or not, and then it was up to Goodwill Hinckley. And the and the the investigation that was nonpartisan that we have the report in the record found that um, Goodwill Hinckley 
did not spend that money on the charter school directly. It spent it on its own overhead, its own operating costs, um, so that it did not just, it didn't go to the charter school. It actually found that explicitly as a finding. So on a motion to dismiss, it's in a complaint that's supported by an independent, uh, bipartisan, nonpartisan part of the legislature that investigated this and found those facts. So at this stage of the case, of course the governor can push on that and argue that and maybe more on summary judgment, but at this stage of the case, uh, the money was going to Google Hinkley, and it did not go, it actually says it did not go directly to the charter school in the findings of the investigative report. Okay, the related question, could you just explain to me the relationship between GWH and Means? Sure, well, the complaint says, they say that there's a statute that makes GWH the authorizing or the authorizer for your means. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So what does it mean to, that's just a statute. So presumably GWH is the authorizer for means. Correct? Yes. So what does it mean to be the authorizer? What obligations do you have as the authorizer under main law? Well, I guess the flip side of that is there's a uh, independent school. It actually had to be separate from the charter school. So it required that the charter school has a separate board of directors. Yep. And it has a separate principal. So the law and the facts and complaint make it clear that there is separation between goodwill and goodwill. I totally understand that. And the charter school. So there's not perfect separation. That's all I'm saying. No, it oversees it. Right. So what does that mean? That's not, what, do you, what do you. Do we have anything in the record that tells us what it means? After you've authorized it, they presumably establish a contract, which has a contract with means, right? Yeah. Well, there's a charter school where you make, you sort of agree to certain uh, requirements to, to get the funding. And I believe that's really with the state or the like, Google Hangar. Does Means and GWH have a contract? Does, the, the, does GWH as the authorizer of Means have a contract with Means? That's not in the records I'm aware of. I, what's in the records, it has its own principal, its own board of directors, and the, the independent report said, is controlled by the charter school. Who goes and oversees a bunch of other programs? This is just one of those. It's been around for about 100 years, so it's definitely not the charter school here. It's, it's, got, it's, it's got integrity and independence uh, that completely transcend the charter school, which is the reason why, if I can just make this final point, that uh, no reasonable official can think that the president of a 100 year old uh, nonprofit charity is subject to a political loyalty requirement. And that's the only exception that Bronte recognizes and this court has recognized. And it's always for a public office or official. That's in every quote from Bronte. This court, only one time this court ever even talked about it being a private entity. And that's the Christmas Zone case, which is completely distinguishable because that entity. That's all in your briefing. That you'll hear from that. Mr. Strawberry. May I please support? Um, the, this case raises a number of different constitutional issues, any one of any one of which is sufficient to dispose of this case at the motion to dismiss stage. Um, but the court need not actually reach any of the three independent bases for dismissing the claim, those being the fact that the retaliatory acts are government speech, that the, that the, the allocation of funding falls within the policymaker exception where uh, partisan or for ideological considerations may influence the government's actions in absolute immunity. And the reason we not reaching those questions is because qualified immunity is an easy decision in this case. The Supreme Court authorizes the court to skip directly to the question of qualified immunity as to whether any clearly established law uh, prohibited the acts that are complained of. Before I get into that argument, I do want to address the point that Judge Barron was pursuing with my friend uh, on the other side. Uh, at page 64 of the appendix, which is our, our initial brief down below, it lays out the statutory history. But there is no dispute in this case that the money, the discretionary funding at issue, was for the Center of Excellence. And there is no dispute that the Center of Excellence is, in fact, Indians. And you can see it in the complaint itself. It's paragraph uh, 78 of the complaint. It makes it clear that the, the discretionary funding that is at issue in this case uh, was allocated to Hinkley for its work operating the Center of Excellence for at risk students. That is that is the, the, the state of the law. It is, it is not a disputed issue of fact. And this attempt to kind of build a wall between Mans and Goodwill Hinkley, I think is really just kind of a last ditch effort to see a complaint that cannot state a claim for relief. And, and to emphasize that point, and we make this point in our policymaker section, the job description that, that, that is referred to in the complaint that was publicly released talked about the fact that the 
person who they were seeking would need would be the leader of both GWH and MEMS. The announcement of Speaker Eves as having received the job, which is also referenced in the complaint, says that he is leading. <laughs> Can you answer the same question I was asking your opponent, which is, what is the relationship between GWH and MEANS? Because MEANS does have a separate board and has a separate principal. GWH, as I understand, is the authorizer of MEANS. And does the record show that there's a contract between MEANS and GWH? I don't know if the record, I mean, I mean the Obey report, which, 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 which he attached to uh, one of his pleadings below, has this in-depth discussion. Yeah. Of I don't know. I can't tell you specifically whether there's a contract. If there's a contract, the contract's not in the record. The contract is not in the record. But what is in the record, plainly, is that is that the position was advertised as being both the leader of both schools. There was overlap among the boards. These are all private employment, aren't they? Uh, they are they are five one C threes, but the money that is issued no, no, in this case is public. Are, are they public or private employment? They are five one C threes, they are not themselves public, but they are receiving public money to operate a public charter school. Does that make them a public employee? It, 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 it means that when determining whether or not the acts with respect to the particular public funding that was an issue here to accomplish a public activity, which was public education for a public charter school, makes it public for purposes. And, and North Bay, for example, makes it clear that private contractors can perform public functions and the policy that can make up for these exceptions can apply to the private contract. Just so I get the limits of your argument, so many private universities operate charter schools. Many private universities operate charter schools. Okay. Is your position then that the governor of the state could make a condition of the university that in order to get funding for the charter school, it has to have a Republican or a Democrat as the president? Uh, our position is that government, when it, when, it, when, it is, when it is providing, well, in this case, future discretionary funding, yeah. is free to make decisions about how it employs that future discretionary so, funding. So is the answer a yes or no? Well, I guess, I guess uh, is your assumption is that, is that the private university is receiving public money to operate the public charter school? Yeah. If the answer to that is yes, then the, then the government, regardless of party, is free to make decisions based on public policy concerns regarding the implementation of charter schools. And but we don't need to know any more about the relationship between the university president and the operation of that charter school? To well, you need to know in some cases. If there, were, if, there, if, there was, if there was true independence, that would be fine. But in this case, on the facts of the complaint, we have a clear relationship. Well, what's true independence in your view? Uh, if, there was, if there was no overlap between the boards, if the leader of, of the chancellor of the university, I mean, I'm not really sure how to, how to apply the hypothetical. Well, isn't the burden on you to show it's a policymaker? Uh, no, the burden is on you to show it's a policy. So unless you can meet that burden, you can't say it's a policy. Well, no, that's not true. Unless, unless, unless we can, the question in this case is whether it was clearly established by law. That's the qualified immunity, and I understand that point. If we chose to also decide, for purpose of clarifying the law, the question of whether there was a violation, the burden would be on you, right? The burden would be on us initially to show that, yes, it is in fact a policy. So how do you meet that burden here? Uh, in this case, we meet the burden from the facts and the complaint that I just referenced that make it clear that this position was advertised as being the, the leader of GWH and MEANS, of the, over, of the search committees, the MEANS board's extensive participation in the search committee process, uh, with the fact that the announcement was that the speaker would be the leader of both MEANS and Google Hinkley, as well as the overlapping statutory requirements, and, and the fact that this specific funding, and again, I think when you're, when you're assessing the, retali the claim for act of retaliation, it's, it's, you got to look at the nature of retaliation in this case. In this case, it's withholding unappropriated future funds uh, that are specific and discretionary to the governor for the operation of the charter school. It should be noted that Minas receives more than a million dollars of other state public education funding that is not discretionary, that is not specific to the center of excellence. And, and there's no allegation that there was any threat or there were any actions taken with respect to that funding. The funding in this case is only for the discretionary point. That leads me to the second point that I really must... Before you go into that, can you just tell me what, what, what in, the, in the complaint gives you uh, support for uh, making this a policy uh, uh, record, uh, a public official that, that has to live up to policy, or establish this policy, I should say? Um, we think that the allegations that the point that establish that this position is policymaker is... Can you tell me specifically what part of the complaint? Yeah, there's... there's, there's, there's I can give you citations if, uh, if Ronnie would like. Um, the job advertisement, which is cited in paragraph seven. Job advertisement, what does it say? It says that the president will lead both goodwill and the main academy of natural sciences, and a leadership role is one of the factors to determine whether someone is a policymaker. 
Well, but it doesn't have to be a policy maker, uh, uh, effective performance of the public office involved. Why is this a public office? The public office in this case is, is the operation of the charter school, which he does not, there's no dispute that, that, that Goodwill Inquia operates me as the charter school. In fact, my friend on the other side has said that in a writing to courts twice in this case. They said it below, you'll see it on page 100 of the appendix. And he said on page 17 of his opening brief to this, to this court, GWH operates me as, and that is the public office that we're talking about in this case. I'm sorry, I'm new to this case, and you're going to have to help me a little more. No problem. What, what, what is the public office? I don't understand that. The public office in this case is the operation of the public charter school. That is the public role that, in this case, the 501c3 is being asked to undertake. That is a governmental role operating the public school. And so the office in this case is, is who is in charge of managing, leading the, the operation of the school. So just so we could sum that up. If we didn't have GWH in the mix, your position is that the principal of a charter school can be uh, made to be of a particular party. Uh, our position is that, is that the kind of criteria that, that illustrates the policy just, of the just, Can the principal of a charter school be made to be of a political party? If it is a public charter school, then uh, I don't know if the principal can, but certainly the superintendent of the school district is. I think in most cases the principal can. But the, but the superintendent of the school district, that's not what we have here? I think it's actually more akin to that because the well, Hinkley, as you pointed out, operates a number of different functions. One of them is implementing, the primary one is implementing the center. The other ones have public functions at all. Um, setting that aside, in this case, the, the only public Well, I understand the superintendent of a school district, but we never held, or I don't know of any case that says the principal of a school can be selected on a partisan basis. Uh, uh, we cited several cases in our brief, including uh, O'Connor. O'Connor Steve's talks about the provision of services at public schools. It's not specific to the principal. Yeah. But so is your proposition that the head of a charter school can be, the funding for the charter school can be conditional on whether it's Republican or Democrat? I think, it, well, yes, although this court has been clear that when it talks about the policymaker exception, Republican Democrat is a shorthand for important public policy goals. And the allegations of the complaint established that there was a heated debate in which both parties to this case were participants on opposite sides as to the advisability of charter schools in the state and, 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 and accomplish and how their mission should be accomplished. So in this case, the answer to that is yes. And this court has been clear that the policymaker role does not necessarily require a high office. It's anyone who's involved in communications, reaching out, otherwise representing the school. And to go back to Judge Borrello's question, in addition to the job, the job announcement also talks about the duties to include the fulfillment and advancement of the mission of GWH and MEANS and its programs. It required working experience working with the legislature, legislators and state policy makers. And the one of the saw was superior communication public relations skills in representing GWH and MEANS to its public and private constituencies. Those are all the types of duties that are consistent with what this court has said constitutes a policy. Assuming there's a public office. Well, yes, but in this case, and, and again, North Lake and North Lake is clear from the Supreme Court that private contractors who are contracted to perform public policy making functions can be treated as, as such for the policy maker exception. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to address this question about the alleged pooling back of funds. I, I, there, there is no dispute in the record, and, 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 the, and the complaint concedes it, that these were discretionary funds that had yet to be appropriated. The budget making process was still in the throes of occurring in the state of Maine at the time. The, the budget was later viewed. Uh, the money uh, in June, there was no money to either appropriate or to provide to me and to the Google Hangley. That, that was unappropriated funds. And any rule that basically suggests that it is an act of unconstitutional retaliation to fail to take uh, a step to provide somebody with unappropriated funds would be extremely problematic. It, for, for no other reason than the fact that that's actually illegal in Maine to provide funds to, that are not yet appropriated. Um, so I don't think that could be the basis for a reasonable retaliatory act. Was that his only threat? That if they weren't, that they wouldn't be appropriate? Uh, well, it was his threat that even if they were appropriate, he wouldn't spend them. Uh, well, and the way the record presents itself on the 12 to 6 months. I think that would have to be a different question. The threat, the, the, the allegation of the point is that he pulled back pay, payment of funds that were scheduled to go out. And vowed not to spend any money going forward. But the, that's an implication that the complaint is, is yeah. drawing upon. But our, certainly our view is that. So what about that one? 
Well, as we make clear, I think as the courts in Bonk order anticipate, governments are free to make decisions based on policy as to what they want to do with bonds. Okay, but that, that's just, that's a different point, right? Uh, well, that's a different point. I will say this, and our absolute immunity argument makes clear. The Supreme Court in Bogan, which was a case that came out of this court, I'm sure the court is familiar with it, was quite clear that budget-making activities, no matter at what point the process... That's your different point. Well, I'm sorry, I don't think, I think that's the same point. Well, I thought we were talking... The question of whether he's trying to set the budget is one point. Right. The question of whether if he's just trying to implement the budget, a spend, an expenditure that's been, that he would have in the future, then you would rely on the policymaker exception, right? That's a different point. Yeah. Okay. It's an additional point, yes. So if it's not a policymaker, and he was not saying we're going to adjust the budget, then what he's threatening is funds that are available to me, I will not spend. If we want to ignore the legislative calendar and the conceded fact that no funds have been appropriated at this point, as we point out, the Young Blood v. Luis case in the Third Circuit makes clear that when the legislature has, has even after the funds are appropriated, left to the discretion of the recipient of the funds how to spend them, it still constitutes budget-making, and absolute immunity still bars claims that arise from it. And there's a need for that. Counsel, what is the actual language quoted in the complaint about what the governor said? There's a number of quotes in the complaint about what the governor said. It quotes the letter that he issued. What did the letter say? The letter talked a lot about the speaker not being qualified for the job and having concerns about his prior opposition to charter schools. That was the gist of the letter. I thought you would help me with the actual language that was used as opposed to a characterization of the language. The letter speaks for itself. I think Mark points that the letter is an act of speech, and I understand why my opponent is specifically saying that the letter is not a basis for his claims, although it is in the complaint, and I think that he's trying to draw inferences from the letter for purposes of this case. The one point that I do want to make before my time runs out is the importance of the qualified immunity aspect. There have been no questions about that today, but I'm sure the court understands how specific the Supreme Court is in requiring qualified immunity, and specifically suggests that courts should think hard and think twice about reaching out to decide constitutional issues when the qualified immunity answer is clear. None of the cases that Mr. Reese has cited, the speaker has cited, at any point in this case come close to this type of particular factual specificity which is required for qualified immunity. What do you say to the Brazil case? I'm sorry, which case? Brazil versus Hogan. Is that the one from the Third Circuit after Zaloga? That's a Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court said a violation that is, quote, so obvious that a reasonable person would have known about it is not entitled to qualified immunity. That is a general principle, but of course that just raises the question as to what is the alleged obvious violation in this case. As we point out, Zaloga, R.C. Maxwell, a number of other cases from other circuits, and no case from this court comes close to suggesting that the actions here even violate the Constitution, let alone meeting the burden of clearly established law. And I will note that that's also true with respect to the policymaker function. We argued that below, and we certainly are willing to stand on that. The reason you shouldn't reach out to decide any of these questions is because if you decide more than merits questions, you're going to have to reach all of the merits questions in this case. That's one of the reasons why in Pearson the Supreme Court said courts should skip to the second step of qualified immunity. That's what we would ask the court to do here. Thank you. Judge Lynch, you had a question. I just want to answer it. Paragraph 7 of the amended complaint is really simple. Somebody asked the governor, did you make the threat? He said, yeah, I did. No, 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 no. Go back to what the language was that was used with the GBH principles, not the characterization later. Usually a motion to dismiss an admission by the defendant is enough to get you passed up. So, Judge Barrett, I did go back and look at it. Could you answer my question before you move on? I'm sorry. There's paragraphs and paragraphs of people talking about it. Yes, what was the actual language that he used? Oh, it was profane. There's a lot of it, but he admitted it. What was the language of the threat? Why are you avoiding this question? 
Well, he admitted to it, so usually on a motion to dismiss, we don't spend a lot of time on something. Before you move on to this, because it would help, be helpful to me to know, I thought there was an exchange between the governor and the funder of GWH that's alleged in the complaint. And the funder said, I came away with the distinct impression that the $1.3 million was going to be gone, and that's plenty on a motion to dismiss. I mean, we have so much of it, it's, it, the other side never contested that they made the threat. So what we have is a, in the record is a representation by the funder about what the governor said to the funder? else in the complaint from the governor beyond the, what you said, which is that he conceded that he had made a threat. So the president of Goodwill Hinckley, who came away at the exact same impression. What's the complaint say about Goodwill Hinckley's president's on that? He had a note that had a conversation that led him to believe that the governor was threatening to withhold the one point three million. That's how he interpreted it. The exact same impression was created here. The benefactor was going to get $3 million to Goodwill Hinckley and realized that the organization was going to be losing a million. The question you asked about the contract, if you look in the appendix, on page 129, it goes through all this. It says the contract between the main charter school commission and means, not with the Hinkley, so the answer to that is not with the So there's no, co so is GWH the authorizer under this charter? This is, the charter statute says there's somebody who's an authorizer. Because it already existed, and it was already an entity that was well respected, it, that's the repository where the charter school got put, but it's not, it, it, it is, the charter school is primarily run according to page 120 of the appendix. If you look, this by the board of directors of the charter school as principal. So there's a major layer of um, independence. Um, it's required, actually, by the provision. And secondly, um, it is not a public charter school. The, the statute I cited in my final brief is a so, private just so, so, you, so again, your, your position is that there is no legal obligation of GWH with respect to means? Well, it's part of means. I mean, it means overseas. And I, I, I don't want to overstate the, the separation, but here's the point. It's a, it's a private school. Just because a private school gets money doesn't make it appropriate for partisan affiliation. There's no I, I, you just, I, I mean, that's I, fine. Okay. I'm just trying to say what, what the legal relationship is between GWH and means. If the point you're trying to make is we can't tell yet, this record, that's fine, but you are conceding that GWH operates means. Yes? In a that's a good complaint. In an umbrella fashion, yeah. but it's more directly controlled by and operated by the board of directors and the principal of the charter school. And just last question, sir. Could you have any content since your complaint says GWH operates means? What do you understand the word operate to mean? Functionally, what does that mean GWH does with respect to means? I mean, it generally oversees it, among other operations, but delegates most of the day-to-day -day operation and the day-to-day -day control to a separate board of directors and a separate principal. And also, the money went to Goodwill Hinkley. It's in the appendix, Your Honor, so it did not go to the charter school, this money we're talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you both.